You're now listening to episode 139 of the Real Estate CPA Podcast. Your source for all things real estate, accounting, and tax. Here we reveal our secrets that can save you thousands in taxes, streamline your accounting process, and help grow your business. Stay tuned to hear insightful interviews with industry experts, successful real estate investors, and current clients on what strategies they use to grow their business and how they steer clear of Uncle Sam. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Brandon Hall and Thomas Costelli joined here today with Matthew Sullivan. Matthew is CEO and founder of Quantum RE, a company that solves a real problem for homeowners by helping them access a portion of their home equity without taking on more debt. Matthew is a proven track record in real estate innovation through his experiences as a co-founder of the Secured Real Estate Income Strategies Fund and as president and founder of CrowdVenture.com, a real estate crowdfunding company. In today's episode, we discuss home equity agreements, a tax-free way to tap into the equity of a property without taking out a loan. We also discuss why hedge funds want in on the single family space, how blockchain will disrupt the future of real estate transactions, and much more. Before we dive right into today's episode, we do want to let everybody know that the Real Estate CPA is hosting the second annual Tax and Legal Summit for Real Estate Investors on Saturday, February 27th and Sunday, February 28th, 2021. At this event, you'll learn about lucrative tax and asset protection strategies from top legal and tax experts. Strategies include the real estate professional status, the short-term rental loophole, how to use passive losses to minimize your taxes, cost segregation studies, 1031 exchanges, self-directed retirement accounts, 2022 tax law changes, also known as the CARES Act, entity structuring, estate planning, and so much more. Don't miss this incredible event designed to save you thousands in taxes and help protect the assets and wealth you've worked so hard to build. Head over to www.taxandlegalsummit.com to grab your tickets for free. That's right. This year, the Tax and Legal Summit is free to attend. Visit www.taxandlegalsummit.com to grab your tickets today. We'll see you there, but for now, we're going to jump right into today's episode. Matthew, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Would you be able to give our listeners a little information on your background? Hey, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me on the show. So my my background is, um, one might say entrepreneurial, the other might say systemically unemployable. Uh, I think the two are sort of very similar. One helps the other. Um, so my background really, I came from my own, started my own business, I think 30 years ago. Uh, it seems like yesterday. And I've been involved in telecommunications, finance, uh, technology uh, in a number of different um, guises over the last few years and um, had a, a internet startup. It all seems very familiar. Seems like it's all happening all over again. Uh, moved to the US about seven years ago with the sole intent of getting involved in real estate. So I set up a real estate crowdfunding company. And then about three years ago, we um, stumbled across this really interesting asset class, which is the equity in single family homes, which is what we focus on now. But behind the scenes over the years, I've you know worked with Richard Branson for a few years. That was great fun. Got involved with all sorts of really cool companies uh, whilst we were working with him. Got involved with the uh, round the world circumnavigation attempt which is where we blew up a very large balloon and tried to fly it around the world with Richard as a pilot, which sort of worked. And yeah, so just had some really interesting experiences in you know various different sectors and um, enjoying every moment of being over here in the US. Nice, nice. Sounds like a lot of interesting stories. If time allows me, we'll have to dive a little bit more into that balloon scenario there. Yeah, didn't he write about that? In, yeah, uh, no, there was in, a book. I mean, there were a number of books. I mean, so this was the Virgin Global Challenger. I think it was in the sort of late 90s. Yeah. Um, but it was um, the, it was pretty interesting because the way it started was my uh, – we had a small corporate finance company based in Kensington, which is just up the road from where Richard's office was. And one of the investments that we made was a very small outfit. We bought a share in a hot air balloon company called Lindstrand Balloons. And my boss, Rory McCarthy, had always had this desire to fly around, around the world in a hot air balloon. So we, he, he had this crazy idea of inviting Richard. So he wrote this letter to Richard Branson saying, you know, would you like to be the pilot for the last great uncharted event around the world? And Richard wrote back saying, you know, dear Rory, why not? So we built this balloon that was completely unflyable because no one had ever flown one before. It was this combination of a, a big bubble of helium and lots of hot air. So it was just you know, you'd make a change and then five minutes later, the effect of what you did happened 
by which time you'd done something else. So, so it was it was sort of bounce up and down in the air like a sine wave. So it was very difficult to fly. Well, it sounds like an interesting story, and uh, you know, glad everybody was able to survive that. It sounds well. That's like, it. Yeah. They did. Yes, yes. That was that was the main thing. Yes. So what we're going to speak about today is about home equity. We're not talking about the traditional methods of home equity, like HELOCs or cash out refinances and the typical stuff you hear in the creative financing world of real estate. We have something new, at least new to us, uh, which is home equity agreements. Uh, Would you be able to tell us a little bit about what home equity agreements are? Well, yeah. I mean, let's start with the problem that we solve. So if you're a homeowner and you've got equity in your home, which you've built up over a number of years... What happens is if you want to access your wealth, because it is your wealth, the only way you can do that right now is to go to the bank and borrow money. Now, you would borrow money through a, some sort of mortgage or a home equity line of credit or perhaps a reverse mortgage. But ultimately, what that means is that you're going back into debt or you're going deeper into debt just to be able to get your hands on your equity. So a home equity agreement is a very different financial tool. It's not a loan in any shape or form. What it is, is equity-based financing, and it allows investors to buy into the potential appreciation of the home and get paid that way, rather than being paid by charging interest. So the investor pays the homeowner a lump sum in exchange for the right to take a share of the current value and some of the potential future increase in value. So when the homeowner sells the home, part of the increase in value goes to the investor, and that's how they get paid. But in exchange, the homeowner gets a lump sum, which is tax deferred. So there's no income tax, there's no capital gains tax to pay at that moment. They can use the capital for whatever they want. It doesn't appear as debt on their credit report. So they can use it to pay off loans. They can use it to invest in other projects that provide liquidity and cash flow. They can use it for increasing their cash position. They can use it to get out of forbearance. They can use it to pay off a mortgage. So there's all sorts of great ways that they can use this capital because it's not debt. And because of that, it allows the homeowner to tap into in most cases, what is their major source of wealth without that burden of having to go back to the bank and borrowing money? So let's let's talk through the actual structure then. So so I've got a hundred thousand dollar home. This is the fair market value, and I've got sixty thousand dollars of debt, so forty k in equity. Yeah. So what we'll do is there's a number of there's a number of sort of criteria. So the minimum that we would invest is thirty five thousand dollars, but we'll just use your your example as a good number. So first of all, everything we do is based on the current value of the home. So you've got a $100,000 home. Let's say you want to unlock $10,000. And again, this is just an example. So that's 10% of the current value of the home. So we write you a check for $10,000. When you sell your home, which can be any time in the next 30 years, what happens is you would give us back the original $10,000 investment together with a share of the appreciation. Now, the share of the appreciation is normally around three times the percentage that we originally invested. So if we originally invested 10%, then we would multiply that by three. So we would share in 30% of the increase in value. So if your home goes up from 100,000 to 110, you'd pay us back 10,000 plus $3,000 as the share of the increase in value. Okay, so I buy a home for 100,000, I've got 60K of debt, I wanna unlock 10% of the home value today, you give me $10,000 in cash. Correct, yeah. Then at some later point when I sell the home, let's say I sell it for 130,000, I give you the $10,000 in cash back. And then yeah. I also give you how much? A share of that $30,000 appreciation. Upfront. And the way we determine that absolute is by saying, how much did we invest to start with? It was 10% of the value of the home. So you multiply that figure by three. And again, this is just an example because it depends on underwriting. So we would get 30% of that $30,000 increase. So the return on the investment would be $10,000. So altogether, you'd be paying us $20,000. Got it. Okay. 
What's the period, like the hold period for something like this? Well, again, it depends really, because the average hold period really is is the same. The, The amount of time that these contracts normally run is about the same period as people normally live in their homes, which is around seven years. But they can run for up to 30 years. So the duration of the agreement is up to 30 years. So that means you have up to 30 years to sell your home or to buy back the agreement. And in most cases, there are no early payment penalties and there's no restrictions on when you can sell your home. And so it's a very flexible instrument. So it can last as short. You can pay it back within three months if you want. So it's a very viable alternative for short-term capital as well as a long-term solution. And so if I if I buy it back, is it just assessed at the current market value? It's assessed at the current market value. Okay. Now, so one other important thing, again, this depends on the agreement. We have 10-year agreements and we have 30-year agreements. Um, With some of the agreements, one of the issues is, what happens if you sell your house for the same amount? In other words, a couple of years later, it doesn't go up. In fact, you sell it for $100,000. So potentially, there's no return for the investor. So what happens with a number of these agreements is we build in a bit of a cushion. So even though your home appraises at $100,000, what we will do is discount that number slightly so that we've already built in a bit of upside. So if your house doesn't appreciate, or in fact, if it goes down a little bit, we've baked in a little bit of upside for the investor just to protect them. Hmm. Is this structured as an option? It's exactly that. Okay. It's an option. So that means you I feel really good that I just nailed that, by the way. Yeah. I mean, I've been I mean, thinking through like, like yeah, how the, the heck credits. is this not a taxable payment? But if it's structured as an option, then it's not, you know, you, the option fee is not taxable when you receive it. And so that makes exactly sense. because it's a future transaction and it's all settled at the point that you sell the home. So if there is a capital gains tax liability, that will crystallize, as of course you know, when the home is sold. But that's why this agreement is so useful because if you're in a position where there is a potential capital gains tax liability, if you were to sell the home, you can unlock some of the equity without monthly payments with a hundred cent dollars, make that work for you without the you know the capital gains tax burden. And again, caveat here underlined, you know, we're not CPAs. You might be, but I'm not. And uh, you know, do your own research. So, um, but this is one of the real sort of tax benefits of of how these programs work. Yep. So you've got an option to buy, and for some folks out there, this might make more sense in like a rent to own situation where your renter comes in and they put an option down, they secure an option to eventually buy the property property from you. And to secure that option, they pay you today $2,000. Well, you get to take that $2,000, do whatever you want with it. And it's not taxable until the option is either exercised or I believe expires. I think that it's taxable at that future point. So that could be five, 10 years from now. That's essentially what Matthew's doing here is he's in a roundabout way, putting an option down on the property to acquire some future value whenever that option is exercised or liquidated yes. or whatever the terms are. So yeah. That makes sense. And also the other benefits of the option are that there's no change of title. So we don't go on as a co-owner. It's not a tenancy in common. Right. And uh, also, again, you can see how it's not a debt product. So mm-hmm. it's not something that is debt pretending it's not. It clearly is something completely different to debt. So the benefits there, if it's not a debt instrument, it doesn't appear on your credit report as debt. It right. doesn't increase the leverage that you have either as an individual or on the property. So it's very useful. You can use it as a down payment on another investment without that being taken into your debt to income calculations. hundred percent. Yeah. So the options, the reason that the fees are not taxable is because it's the option of some future event and the taxes are all going to stack up at that future event. So whatever whatever cash changes hands today is not taxable. And that is supported by case law. I can't cite them off the top of my head, but we've done that research before. Uh, and I feel comfortable saying that on the podcast. Now, my question to you, Matthew, so anybody that knows what options are, especially if you've been in like the equity markets and trading call options or put options, uh, you know that they can be risky. So talk to us about the risks of doing this, either from the person who's coming in with that $10,000 cash or for the homeowner themselves. Actually, take it from both sides. What are the risks to the homeowner? What are the risks to that investor? Well, the risks are clearly dependent on the performance of the underlying asset. So this is an investment. 
So because it's not a loan secured by a property, it's an investment effectively in the future performance of that property. So the risk really hinges and depends on how much that house is going to be worth. So that's the primary risk. Now, the secondary risks are to do with what the homeowner does to the property. So there are risks that from an investor's perspective, that the property is allowed to fall into disrepair, uh, that the homeowner does something uh, that they really shouldn't do that undermines the potential value. Those protections or protections to prevent that are written into the agreement. And we try and balance that by making sure that the homeowner maintains a level of equity in the property after the transaction so that there is always First of all, skin in the game from the uh, homeowner's perspective. In other words, they still have a big chunk of equity, but also that there's a little bit of a cushion. So should we need to increase the amount that the homeowner owes through some form of delayed capital that we would need to fix the property, that can come out of their equity. So the primary sort of risks from an investor's perspective, if the value of the property significantly falls and the homeowner sells, then there is a risk to the investor that the return will be low, or potentially the investor may lose money. From the homeowner's perspective, there's no real risk as such, because there's no monthly payment. So there's no risk of foreclosure from that perspective. What the homeowner does really is just have to calculate what their cost of capital is. So from a homeowner's perspective, they need to make sure that they understand how these uh, agreements work and that the amount of potential increase in value that they are paying is acceptable to them. So really, it's not so much a risk from a homeowner's perspective. It's really just a, um, a calculation of what share of the upside they're going to give. So who's this product primarily for? Because I'm, I'm like going through a bunch of different scenarios in my mind and I'm thinking, okay, if I'm in San Francisco or New York City and my property appreciates relatively quickly, how does the cost of capital compare to just like a cash out refinance of some form? Because like if I'm in one of these highly appreciating markets, would that be more costly? Would, would this type of capital usage, would this be more costly to me in the long run if I'm in highly appreciating areas? I think the answer is yes, yep. um, it would be. So compared to a low interest rate HELOC or a cash out refi, the cost of capital would be higher from a home equity agreement. And that depends on a number of factors, but it, it will be higher. But the important thing is to compare apples with apples. So if you are able to borrow money and you have the ability to support the monthly payments, then this may not be the best product for you. However, if you are in a position where you have a significant amount of equity and you don't qualify for a loan or you do not want to borrow money, then you can still access your equity without having to go into debt. That's a very large number of people that are in a position today that has been caused by you know external reasons where they yeah. find themselves in the situation where they don't meet the credit requirements for the bank they find themselves in a position where they're in forbearance until they clear that forbearance sum they can't refinance they can't do anything so they're in that kind of catch 22 situation but to answer your question our customers really fall into sort of two or three buckets the first is those who cannot borrow money but have a need for capital and that could be just to repair existing credit problems, pay off you know, credit cards or deal with immediate cash flow problems where they can't borrow money from the banks. The second group are people were, that have wealth in their home equity but don't want to borrow money. So they don't want the idea of monthly payments or additional debt. So here is a way for them if they're retired, for example – simply don't want the idea of borrowing money, we can release capital that they can use for any purpose. And the third are the investors who look at their property as a concentrated asset and say, well, I've got all of this money tied up in one asset. What I want to do is access some of that capital and use that capital to invest in other assets. Might be stocks, bonds, might be other properties. It gives them the ability to diversify, gives them the ability to turn their home equity into cash flow. And for those people, it's really a discussion. What is the cost of capital going to be? What are the likely returns that I can make? Is A greater than B? And also, do I like the idea of having liquidity? So, There's a number of moving parts into why people see this type of program as attractive. Can we go over the 
well, what the costs look like if I can't actually sell my property at some appreciated rate. So I, the value is 100, same loan, 60,000, so my equity is 40. I get you to come in, give me 10. Yep. I sell it five years later for 100. What does that look like? Well, again, so what we would do when we go into the agreement, we would discount the value of the home from the beginning. So even though your home appraises at 100,000, typically we would apply a 15 to 20% discount to that property. So we would say that your home, uh, we would start the clock running at say 80 or $85,000. So that means if you sell your home for $100,000, which is the same amount it appraises for, but it hasn't gone up, we've actually got $15,000 built in. So we would take a share of that built in appreciation. Okay, cool, cool. So there is a chance that if if I take this 10,000, and I, I sell the property at some later point for you know hundred thousand dollars, then I could be paying you back thirteen, fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars. Yes, okay. that, that's right. But if it significantly falls, it starts going beyond that cushion. So the investor at some point will begin to take a loss. And so that means that you could, if the property falls, let's say to seventy thousand dollars for whatever reason, and that's sold at a bona fide third party price. In other words, you're not selling at a discount to a, to a relative, for example. Hmm. Um, then the investors will take a loss at that point. So they will only be able to get back a lower amount. So you, it's not like a loan where you can go underwater at that point. With this type of agreement, we would be paid back less than the original investment. Got it. Interesting. So the investor actually takes on a lot of risk then. Yeah. And again, the way to balance that really is to be careful about where we pick the properties. So, you know, we're underwriting properties primarily in the major MSAs and uh, we tend to avoid higher priced properties, which are very difficult to value or lower priced properties. The minimum property value actually is about a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Uh, We'll avoid rural properties and also properties in states where you don't have that house price appreciation that you would see in places like California or New York, for example. If this option exists, does it make it harder to sell the property at all? Are there extra compliance steps that I need to be aware well, of? Well, no, it doesn't because it doesn't affect the rights of the new buyer. So it's not like a an option or a first right of refusal. So a first right of refusal um, really controls what the current owner can do. This doesn't do that at all. All that it does is it means that when you sell the property, some of the proceeds of the sale go to the holder of the home equity agreement. Now, the home equity agreement is protected by a lien on title. So as the house is sold through the escrow process, part of the sales proceeds will go to pay off that lien. The lien is always in a junior position to the primary lenders. So it doesn't affect the person coming in because by the time they buy the property, they'll be buying it free and clear of any existing liens. And there aren't uh, any impingements or encroachments on the title going forwards. Got it. And so with with Quantum RE, you're the broker for these agreements. Is that right? We both a broker for other companies in this space. There's a number of companies that operate in this space. So if we find a customer that doesn't match our investors' requirements, then we will see if we can help that customer by finding a home for them with one of the other companies in this space. What we also do, though, is we work as an originator for our own capital sources. So we have agreements with a a source of capital that's looking for a particular type of home in a particular area. And the number of those agreements, I think, will expand over the next year as more people are looking to get involved as investors. So we both, we act as an originator for a specific group of capital and uh, an introducer or a broker. We don't invest our own capital. Got it. What what does the investor pool look like for folks that are trying to get into this? Uh, What what are they looking for that they couldn't find in like regular real estate or lending? The investment pool is primarily long-term capital, hedge funds, endowment funds, uh, multifamily offices that have an allocation to an asset-backed long-term equity play that doesn't necessarily have to have a cash pay. Um, Now, because of that multiple, what we're getting is a structurally leveraged return. So in other words, you've got the house price index, which let's say is 5%. Now, because of the way the home equity agreement works, 
the investor gets more than the house price index. They get that sort of leveraged return. They're getting three times that. So the profile of a home equity agreement is very attractive to capital sources that have a long-term investment horizon. Most of these hedge funds have allocations, relatively small allocations for this type of, you know, this type of investment. So at the moment, primarily we're targeting or we're working with these types of funds. Now, what's interesting though is more and more capital is moving into the space. It's a very large investment class. There's about $15 trillion worth of equity in single family homes in the US. Now, not all of that is accessible because some of those homes, people have got lots of loans that we couldn't untap it. So we think the addressable market is probably about five to six trillion, but that's still quite a lot. So for someone to be able to get an asset-backed investment in real estate, where it's owner-occupied, so you haven't got that carrying cost of managing the rent and dealing with toilets, termites, and trash. So it's a very interesting asset class for investors. So we're seeing more and more investors coming in. And what our objective is as a company is to try and open this asset class out to smaller accredited investors to start with, and and ultimately to non-accredited investors who can buy into this as a way of I suppose, hedging there or diversifying their investment portfolio. So I, I got a quick question before we shift gears a little bit. So you, you mentioned that the hedge funds are getting to the space and there's huge untapped potential for uh, single family rentals, right? And we've had other guests come on the show and we've talked to other people in the industry and they say that the hedge fund sector is really trying to get their hands involved in the single family market. I mean, they're buying single family portfolios by the droves. Yep. Do you have an idea of why that is? Why are the hedge funds trying to get get their hands on? Well, I think rental? this is. I mean, again, this is different to a rental because this type of investment does not involve ownership of the underlying asset. Now, if you want to buy portfolios of properties so that you can rent them out, then it's always been a solid asset class because you've got, you know, it's diversified. You've got cash flow, you've got capital appreciation. If you've got enough scale, you can then get economies of scale. So in other words, you can have your own in-house management companies and uh, you know uh, and and that makes it more efficient now the important thing is this is a different type of investment to where you're buying the property and then renting it out because with our investments the owner still lives in the property so in other words you're yeah. you're, you're investing in something which is where there's an owner occupier Got it. Got it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me clarify. I know I kind of said single family rental. It's sorry, yes. I kind of think of uh, the, that market, I guess. You know, what's the appeal of the single family sector? I guess why, why are hedge funds, you know, there's so many different aspects of the economy that the hedge funds can get involved in. It seems like, you know, there's a lot of institutional capital that's being attracted to the single family asset class. Is there a specific reason for, we, for that? Is it just because it's a well, stable again, asset I mean, class? If you look at just capital ad, uh, allocations generally, so a hedge fund on average will not invest just in this asset class unless that is its pure investment objective you know but as an asset class if you look at single family residences you know it's a well proven track record in terms of historically there's a lot of information about how house prices and home ownership performs as an asset class so it's very large so you've got the ability to deploy trillions of dollars depending on the type of investment, there is a cash pay as well. So it is a yield generating asset. And I think really the most important thing is it's a physical asset. So as opposed to you know, you know, stocks or bonds or options or derivatives or synthetics, a home or a, a piece of real estate is a physical asset. And if you look historically, the value of real estate in the US in the residential sector has always outperformed inflation if you look at any 10-year period. So if you look at any 10-year period over the last 100 years, during that 10-year period, the average value of residential homes has increased faster than inflation. So you've got a diversified asset class that's producing cash pay, that's asset-backed, and that historically has proven to deliver you know, a, a solid greater than inflation return. So for certain allocations, that is attractive. Now, it's not attractive to the funds that are looking for that super high alpha by investing in technology, you know, equity plays, for example. But you know, for certain funds and for certain capital objectives, it's an ideal large distributed asset class. 
you know, that makes a lot of sense. And I'm sure a lot of investors on here listening to this podcast are happy to hear that, you know, real estate is so favorable, um, you know, in terms of like the hedge against inflation. But switching gears just a little bit, moving a little bit into the tech and digital space, we do understand that, you know, you're also involved in a crowdfunding platform, a crowd venture. Yeah. Um, what is crowd venture and what makes it unique from, from other platforms? Well, well CrowdVenture really was the beginning. So I set that up seven years ago, just about seven years ago, when the Jobs Act really was still very young. And the Jobs Act was the act that, first of all, opened up the ability for you to make public non-registered offerings to people where you didn't have a previous relationship. So in other words, what the Jobs Act did is said, you can now have an online platform where you can offer investments as long as they're to accredited people and you can prove that. And that was a major change. And so CrowdVenture really was the sort of stepping stone. And, and it's been sort of rather dormant over the last three years in particular. Um, but what it did is it gave me a great understanding about how the crowd tends to work in an investment um, you know, scenario. And also it gave me a very strong background about how these types of deals can be structured from a legal and regulatory compliance perspective. So really, last three years, my focus has really entirely been on quantum and uh, home equity, which is a, an asset class that we stumbled across about five years ago when I was, I think I was at a crowdfunding conference. Um, the challenge with crowdfunding real estate really is getting the quality deals and managing those deals because they're actually quite difficult to find. And the really interesting thing about quantum and these home equity agreements is there's much more of them. So trying to find good quality loans, for example, where you're you're finding borrowers that you think you can probably rely on to repay the loan, that's far harder than finding good quality homes where you can reliably predict what the uh, inflation is going to be. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. And again, continuing along, I guess, the technology uh, line of questions, we do know that cryptocurrency and the blockchain technologies have you know gained a lot of traction over the last few years. I'm sure everybody's aware of Bitcoin and all of that. Um, but up to today, the blockchain enthusiasts, they really foresee disruption in almost every sector as a result of this. I guess from an end user and investor standpoint, what do you see coming down the pipeline for the real estate industry? Well, I think it's um, it just has to happen because blockchain is a technology. Now, to answer your question directly, what we want people to see in the real estate market is just what they see today, but it will be easier and faster. Now, what they won't see and what we don't want them to see is how it's done. You don't want them to be able to see how blockchain or any of these other new technologies play a role. Because in the same way that when you go to your bank online or when you go to E-Trade, you don't really want to know how that stuff works behind the scenes. You just want to know that today I can buy stocks, I can build a portfolio, and I can sell from the comfort of my armchair with the, you know, the click of a button. So there's no reason why real estate, which is an asset class, cannot, over a period of time, benefit from the same levels in terms of increased efficiencies and lower cost because of these types of technologies. So if you think of all the costs that's involved in buying and selling a property in terms of the agents, the legal fees, the registration fees, how a lot of it is still paper-based, as those types of transactions move onto a platform that enables transactions to happen without people, that will speed things up, it will reduce the cost, and therefore that will make these types of transactions happen you know, faster and there will be more of them. For us, what that enables us to do is think about taking our home equity agreements and chopping them up into little pieces and making those investable. And there's a, there's a lot of regulatory and compliance you know, uh, hurdles that we have to overcome. But I think the technology now is at a low enough price. What blockchain does enables you to do these things at a cost that's far lower than it would be if you were to use standard database technologies. So the combination of lower cost technologies, reliability, people's adoption of blockchain and cryptocurrencies, their ability to embrace these new things, it's very similar to what happened in the internet 20 years ago. When it first started, People didn't really know what it was. You had that sort of initial adoption, then it sort of blew up and fizzled out. And then what was left 
became the Amazons of what we see today. I think that's really where we're going, not just with cryptos and blockchain, but just this sort of new type of technology as a whole that is making our traditional industries you know, more efficient and that ultimately benefits the end user. Absolutely. When you see this... Um because yeah, there's been a lot of talk about Bitcoin and, and what have you. Just for an example, it's the biggest piece of blockchain technology people probably hear about. And the adoption, the actual practical use of it hasn't really kind of came to fruition yet, at least in so far as I could tell. When do you foresee this actually becoming adopted to the point where it's actually usable for the everyday you know, real estate investor or is that still up in the air? Well, I think things, um, it, it tends to happen where it feels like nothing has happened then suddenly what could we do without it? And again, if you look at banking and broking, can you imagine what life would be like if you had to go to your branch to do a transaction like we had to do years ago? If you wanted to pay someone, you had to write them a check. You couldn't use Venmo or PayPal. or Now, the fact is these things are here, so you rely on them. But before then, it was quite difficult to do transactions in an efficient way. And again, if you look at the way that property is transacted and ownership is transferred, it's done very much at a local level with local regulations. There are no central registries, either at a state or a federal level. So that means the process of transferring ownership of a property from one person to another is a convoluted and expensive affair because it involves a number of manual processes with independent parties like attorneys and you know realtors, et cetera. So if you can disintermediate that, those people and make that process more effective, and you can do that by the registration process, then what that does is that makes ownership transfer much more efficient and much cheaper. And that's where you're going to see the immediate knock-on effect. Because if I can transfer ownership electronically, then I don't need a lot of the people in the ecosystem to do that for me. So that does cut out a lot of the people. It creates opportunities for a whole additional group of new types of services around that. But what it does is it dispenses with the old, you know, slowing down processes and, and gives us the ability to expand and do all sorts of new, really interesting things with with real estate. I agree. Agreed. And it sounds exciting. I just imagine a ton of resistance, a ton of resistance coming from the people who are currently in those seats that would be replaced by blockchain. Um, in adopting this, is that something you would you would see, you would foresee? Yeah, and it will. I mean, you cannot underestimate that, and it will take a long time for this to get um, the sort of adoption that makes it ubiquitous or universal. And again, if you look at how long, and it's not just you know the individuals concerned; it's the legal and the regulatory environments that have to change as well. But it's difficult to fight it. You know, it is going to happen. It's going to take a long time, but ultimately it will get there. Now, the internet is over 20 years old now. And I think during that period, we've seen systemic changes in every industry and uh, apart from real estate. (laughs) Um, But so every industry has embraced the web over time and regulations have changed to enable that to happen. So I think it will happen, but pieces of it will happen faster than others. And what we're seeing as an example, is in the world of financing and uh, an exchange of shares. You know, companies are now able to transfer share ownership without the T plus two or the T plus three, where that change of ownership can be done instantly. So there are digital exchanges that are emerging that enable share ownership to change hands instantly. And that's the beginning of a, of a sea change for the way that the shares are managed. And again, just think of the legal and regulatory um, hurdles that have to be overcome to enable that to happen. Yeah, that, that's the biggest part, right? Um, so, you know, it, we, this has all been very insightful today from the home equity agreements all the way down to, you know, what's coming up on the blockchain front. If, if our listeners want to learn more about you, what you have going on, want to learn more about the home equity agreements, what's the best way for them to do so? Well, great. Thank you. Well, we put everything on our website. So it's quantumre.com, Q-U-A-N-T-M-R-E.com. Uh, and everything is there. So we have a calculator that enables you to find out what the potential amount that we could unlock uh, would be. All of the podcasts and videos and interviews and, you know, we have a downloadable free guide. They're all there on the website. And, you know, the best part is there are human beings behind the website too. So if you want to contact any of us, ask the phone numbers there, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get back to you as soon as we can on email. So, you know, we're pretty responsive. And, um, you know, we, we do speak to, you know, hundreds and hundreds of customers. So we, we would love to hear from you. Nice, nice. So what we're going to do is we're going to drop that in the show notes below for everybody who's listening. Uh, like always, if you want to learn more about 
Matt and what he has going on. You feel free to check out Quantum RE. And uh, Matt, thanks again for coming on today. That's great. Thank you for having me on. It's been great fun. Thanks for listening to today's show. If you enjoyed the show, please find us on iTunes and leave us a review. You can also email us at contact at therealestatecpa.com with any feedback or topic suggestions. We are always taking on new clients and with the new tax laws in play, you really don't want to navigate this alone. Let us help you save money on taxes and with your accounting and CFO needs. To become a client, navigate to our client page at therealestatecpa.com and fill out a web form with as much detail about your situation as possible. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great rest of your week.